All right, hello everyone. Good afternoon from Austin, Texas. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Digital Collections Love-In. Um, my name is Elliot Williams. I use he, him pronouns and I'm the DPLA Aggregation Service Coordinator with Texas Digital Library. Also with us today are several other folks from TDL, including our Executive Director, Christy Park, our Deputy Director, Courtney Muma, Communications Director, Leah DeForest, and possibly some other TDL folks who might be in the list. Um, Leah, if you could go to the next slide, please. So just as always, a little housekeeping before we get going. Um, please keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking, but we love to see your faces if you wanna show them. So feel free to leave your cameras on or turn them on when you're speaking. But of course, also feel free to turn them off if it's that kind of day. Um, we hope you'll use the chat box to say hello and let others know you're here. Uh, as well as make comments and share resources throughout today's presentation. Chat is also where we'll share out some links related to the content that we're sharing today. Um, and if you have a question, please share it in the chat. We'll have time for questions and discussion throughout the session today. Um, so drop those in the chat as you think of them. Live captioning has been enabled and you can view live captioning by clicking on the closed caption button on your Zoom toolbar. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and we will publish slides and recordings on our web website and in the TDL repository. Next slide, please. We at Texas Digital Library are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive for all people. So we ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. And again, as a reminder, we will publish slides and notes as well as the recording and share those with everyone who registered. Next slide. And finally, Texas Digital Library is grateful to all of our members. Many of you are here today. Um, who put our, your trust in TDL to provide essential library infrastructure and services, including digital preservation, digital repository hosting, tools for managing electronic theses and dissertations, research data, support for open educational resources, and metadata aggregation for DPLA. We invite any institution interested in becoming part of our consortium to reach out to us. We need your energy and expertise to continue growing the digital library community in this region. And we invite you to connect with our amazing, fun, brilliant community of librarians and archivists. Next slide, please. <clears throat> To kind of kick us off today, I wanted to give just a short introduction to DPLA and TexHub for those of you who might not be familiar with them yet, um, since this is a big part of why TDL is hosting this event today and why we're excited to talk about sharing and celebrating digital collections. The Digital Public Library of America, or DPLA, is a project that aggregates digital cultural heritage materials from institutions around the country. It currently includes metadata for over 44 million items, and that number grows regularly. And all of those items are discoverable through DPLA's site, which is just dp.la. And users who want to view the full object are linked back to the item in its original institution's repository. TexHub is the Texas hub of DPLA and is a joint project of Texas Digital Library and the Portal to Texas History at UNT. As I'm sure most of you know, the Portal to Texas History provides services for digitizing, hosting, and creating metadata for digital collections. And metadata for all of the materials that are in the portal has been included in DPLA for many years. And recently, TDL has begun offering a pathway for other institutions that host their own digital collections, no matter what system they use, to share metadata about those materials with DPLA. So whether your library hosts your own collections or shares them through the portal to Texas history, your institution has a pathway to contribute them to DPLA. We're gonna include some more information about TDL DPLA aggregation service in the follow-up email to everyone who registered for today's event. Um, and we've shared some links in the chat as well. And if you're interested in talking about it more, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, sharing metadata about digital collections with DPLA is a great way to reach new users and broaden the audience for the amazing digital resources that libraries hold, which leads me to today's main event. Next slide, please.
So I'm so excited to welcome you all to what we're calling the Digital Collections Love-In. Um, because it's Valentine's Week and International Love Data Week, we wanted to just talk about all the things we love about digital collections. Libraries and archives put a huge amount of effort and skill into digitizing materials and making them available online. And this event is just an opportunity to celebrate that. So from the people who digitize materials, upload and manage items in a repository, create metadata, preserve the digital files and more, a lot of love and care goes into creating digital collections. And then once those collections are online, even more work and creativity goes into helping users discover them, enjoy them, learn from them. Library staff create digital exhibits, share collections on social media, write educational resources for K through 12 classrooms, upload collections to crowdsourcing platforms, create online jigsaw puzzles from digitized images, which is my new favorite thing. The list just goes on and on of the ways we share our collections with people. And so we want today's love in to be a chance for our community to show off the ways you're promoting and providing access to digital collections. My hope is that it will give everyone a chance to celebrate the work that you and your colleagues have done, maybe get some inspiration from things that other folks are doing, and just learn about all of the cool collections held by institutions in our area. Next slide, please. So here's how today's webinar is going to go. Um, we had a huge response to this event, which I'm really excited about. Um, so we reached, I reached out individually to some of you beforehand who had volunteered to share your digital collections or exhibits. And so I've asked these folks to talk about their sites and collections, but just real briefly, just like a minute or two each. Um, so I'm hoping it's going to be sort of fast paced and fun, kind of like digital collections lightning round. Um, so I'll call on folks as we go. And when it's your turn, just say your name, your institution, and just a little bit about your site, whatever you think is interesting or unique or exciting about it. Um, I'll be sharing my screen throughout, and all of the links are in the community notes document as well, so you can explore the materials on your own. I've split folks up into groups of about four or five, so we'll hear from a few people, then kind of pause for questions and discussion after each group. Um, and as I said, if you have questions or comments for anyone, please feel free to drop those in the chat as we go, and then we'll have some time at the end for additional sort of sharing and discussion. Um, as I said, we had a great response to this event, and I'm excited to see so many people here. And we're definitely planning on doing something like this again. So if you don't get a chance to share something today that you were hoping to, um, this definitely won't be your last chance. We do have a community notes document, as I mentioned, and I think Courtney just put it in the chat. Um, the link is also on the screen. As I said, all of the links for all of these sites are in that document, um, and there's also space for notes. So please feel free to edit that document and add your thoughts, your ideas, your takeaways, whatever you think um, is worth recording there. And we'll be sharing out that document in the follow-up email to everyone who registered today as well. So I think that's it for the preamble. So now it's time to get to the good stuff. So Leah, if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing your screen and I will switch to sharing mine. All right. And I think Lori from Texas A&M Corpus Christi, if you're here, you get to go first. Take it away. Uh, Lori, I think you're still muted. I can't hear you. I'll start again. Hello, <laughs> my name is Lori Atkins, and my pronoun is she. Um, I'm from Texas A&M Corpus Christi. I am the director of the archives. I did not create this exhibit, Ed Warga did, and it is on the Omega platform. Um, it is about a wonderful musical family that gave us their collection here in Corpus Christi, the Galvan family. And um, they were kind of post pioneers here, uh, arriving in um, the early 1900s. Um, uh, Rafael Galvan was one of the was the first Mexican American police officer in the city. He kind of he broke a lot of barriers. He was a businessman. He built and opened up a ballroom. Um, the whole family was very musical. All the boys played horn instruments. Um, the, the ballroom was a tremendous success and um, for the Mexican American population and many, many events were there. It is still there today. Um, however, it's in disrepair and we're working with the family to perhaps get uh, 
get some funding for them to redo the ballroom. Um, I like this exhibit because it spawned many other um, projects like a oral history project uh, with the senior Galvan family members. And um, it, of course, COVID stepped in or COVID came and we had to um, pause on that, but we're going back to it right now. So Omega does make a nice platform where um, it's a little bit static, but it makes a good platform to, um, to portray a family history. That's so cool, Lori. Thank you. I love that that this exhibit sort of spawned other things. That's really neat. Uh, next up is Julie from UNT. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Judkins. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the assistant head of special collections at UNT. Uh, today, I'm sharing the Stephen Fromholtz papers. Uh, he is a UNT alum. Um, he was actually a at least involved in the, the folk music society here at UNT, um, if not in the leadership. Um, and as you can see, this collection is hosted in the portal to Texas history. Um, Stephen Fromholtz uh, wore many hats uh, throughout his career. And I guess that's the appropriate way to describe him because he was often known as the man in the big hat. Um, but he was a singer songwriter primarily uh, who was inducted into the Texas Music Legends Hall of Fame. Um, he also served as the 2007 Texas Poet Laureate, um, and he also uh, was a river guide um, for several years, and there's photography um, from some of, or at least one of his tours. Um, the collection spans the 1950s to, to 2014. Um, Fromholtz uh, passed away unexpectedly in January 2014, and it was at that point that uh, the collection came to UNT. Uh, the collection contains photographs, clippings, audio recordings, and videos, um, so you can hear audio recordings of Fromholtz as well as some of his contemporaries, um, as well as the concert photographs and uh, other fun things. Um, there are just under 500 items, or I guess, you know, 426 items that are available digitally right now. Um, of course, we're hoping to add to that. Um, but the finding aid is quite extensive. Um, so in the collection description up at the top, if you're interested in uh, looking at more of the materials in the collection, um, you know, we'd be happy to hear from you. We can also digitize things on demand um, if there are items that you're interested in um, that aren't available uh, just yet. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, Steve Fromwaltz's songs have been covered by Lyle Lovett, Willie Nelson, Wait, Axton, John Denver, um, as well as others. Um, and uh, if you are interested in learning more about Mr. Fromholtz, uh, there is a documentary that is going to be coming out. I believe it's called The Man in the Big Hat. Um, and uh, I don't know when that's airing yet, but we have uh, provided some materials for that. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it's going to be great. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. That's great. I want to go listen to all of his music right now. Uh, oh, he's a fantastic songwriter. You, you should. Uh, having that thing where I can't switch tabs on my browser because of Zoom. All right, next up, uh, Brea from Houston Tillotson. Are you here, Brea? Yeah. Hi, my name is Brea Brown. Oh, Brea, uh, sorry. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, I'm the university archivist at Houston Tillotson University. Um, so I wanted to share uh, that this digital collection is uh, very new. Uh, we just launched our digital archives in the summer of 2020. Um, I actually just obtained this position in December. So, um, but our library director, uh, Danielle McGee and uh, another uh, past, oh, thank you. <laughs> another past, um, uh, library assistant actually uh, helped with processing and digitizing uh, the collections you see here. Um, so I would definitely say like one of my favorites is the Houston Tillotson Charter Day papers uh, because I actually um, went through uh, the entirety of the, the collection and I created a finding aid which you can find in the Texas Archive of Resource and Resource Online which is Taro. Um, 
So I really enjoyed uh, processing uh, and the metadata for this collection because there's audio recordings. Uh, there's also uh, student newsletters, uh, the university newsletters, and um, but also it's it's describing a lot about the merger that happened between the two colleges that was here. Um, that one, the first one is uh, was established in uh, 1881, which was the Tillotson College, and then uh, Samuel Houston College, which was established in Dallas first in 1876, but then eventually moved to Austin in 1878. And um, I don't know if any of you guys know this, but Houston Tillotson University is actually the oldest uh, in institution in um, in Austin. So I think it's great that we're able to have. Uh, this collection that really talks about the history of Austin and the people who, um, who and it, the people and the educators that was a part of this institution. Um, another great um, collection that I enjoy um, referring to is Dr. Mary E. Branch's paper. Uh, and she was actually the first uh, female president uh, of the college, at the Tillotson College at the time. And um, I guess special correspondences is actually, uh, it highlights the development of the library back in 1934. Um, and that's when we'll, the, the, the correspondences is, are between like other uh, religious institutions, mm. uh, just between her and, and uh, other reverends asking like, oh, well, I, I noticed that you're, or I heard that you were looking for some books. Uh, is there anything that I could actually like give to you? Like what you guys need? And Mary, uh, Mary actually responded back saying like, oh, well actually like our, our students could use like a plethora of books, like from languages to sci the sciences, uh, to history, uh, anything that you can offer. So you can see the development of the library, which is very exciting because uh, that's where I work today. So it's just a bit of, about the collection so far. Awesome, thank you. That's, wow, I didn't realize that these collections were so new. That's really cool. Congratulations, yeah. Um, and then next up in this group is Tarrant County College. Um, and I'm not sure, Tom Kellum shared this with us. I'm not sure if he was able to make it today. Um, so I'll just say a few words about it as well. Um, but. Tom, if you're here or anyone else from Tarrant County College, please feel free to jump in um, and share anything with us that you'd like. Um, so these are great digital collections and exhibits um, from Tarrant County College. Uh, the, the digital collections look like they're in Prima, which is, which is neat. Um, yeah, the, the wanted posters are really kind of fascinating. Um, just a really unique collection. I've never seen a collection like this before. Um, and then I also really enjoyed the ooh, these exhibits in that are just in LibGuides, which I think is just sort of a they're really effective at kind of guiding you through the materials. And there's I in my past job I worked a lot on history of aviation collections, so I was immediately drawn to this aviation stuff. Um, and just I love that it kind of helps you understand all of these things that you're looking through and sort of as someone who you know doesn't know a ton about the subject, it kind of guides you through it, which I think was really neat. And so that I think is it for group one of sharing folks. Thanks to all of you. Any questions, comments for folks? I noticed there was a bunch of um, comments in the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to unmute and say anything about any of these first four sites. I love that Lauren mentioned that they have some Steve Fromholtz materials at Texas State too. Just that kind of cross pollination between institutions. It's really neat. I'll go ahead and say this so you don't have to, Elliot, but that's one of the lovely things about the DPLA is that when you've got the metadata in the DPLA, 
aggregated, then you can find all of the different institutions that have holdings on a person. So it puts them into that nice context and I love it. Thanks, Courtney. All right, well then let's go ahead and keep on trucking. So next up, uh, Emily from UT San Antonio. Thanks. So yeah, I'm uh, Emily Johnson uh, at UT San Antonio. Yeah, Courtney, San Antonio. Um, and I wanted to share um, a collection we have in our institutional repository called the Defining Moments Collection. And so this was a, um, a project that we were approached by faculty from across the university. They were working on this big project where students at the beginning of the pandemic where students could share their experiences and um, use that as a way to to create connections among students but then also preserve this like unique historic moment um, so that people could see that in the future and so what the way that this project went really quickly was like a class of history students would write a reflection about their life and their experience and how that connects to their family and then an art student would create an art piece and then a dance student would choreograph a dance that would be set to music that uh, the music students would compose. And so what we tried to do, our, our component of, I, I legitimately cried, like when I looked at some of these, Courtney, like, um, and so our component of this was archiving the actual artifacts and making sure that they were organized and searchable in the repository. But there was also a showcase that just happened a couple months ago. Um, they were able to put together an in-person um, showcase where they, you know, performed the works, and that was really emotional too because we were kind of, it was pre Omicron getting really bad, so we kind of felt like we were in a different place. And anyway, it's I could talk about this project all day, but um, I love this. It's all student undergraduate student work talking about their life and their experiences during COVID. And then I also um, I pulled out a link of one of our specific uh, items called Disinfect. This is my favorite and it's this really moving art piece, I think that's kind of, it was featured in the San Antonio newspaper and all sorts of stuff. So um, I'm really proud of this. It's UTSA students and uh, it continued through 2021 and then the project is kind of changing but we are gonna continue collecting things this year. So there'll be more coming. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you, Emily. It's, yeah, it's really moving. Next up, Abra from Trinity, another San Antonio white, San, San Antonioan. Sure. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Abra. I'm at Trinity University. I'm the university archivist there. Um, so this is a um, digital exhibit, uh, a result from a Mellon undergraduate research project that I helped facilitate last summer. Um, the Trinity University Women's Intercollegiate History Pro Athletics History Project um, has been a history project going on at Trinity since about 2015 or 2016 with former faculty and alumni collecting a lot of the interviews and gathering a lot of the historical information. Um, but all of these oral history interviews were coming into the archives right around uh, when COVID was hitting and they were still conducting them and they needed me to kind of help facilitate um, those recordings. And so um, uh, I, you know, know, having an oral history background, I kind of knew that they could come into the archives and just kind of get lost in time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I knew about our undergraduate research program and thought that this would be an excellent project to develop a website around um, the interviews and also have students create digital exhibits. So if anybody's interested, they can watch that video down there, um, which is basically the student presentation that they would have had given in person, but we were still remote last summer. So um, they, they edited this, they compiled all of that, that presentation, and it just, uh, I just love watching it because I, I really got to know each of the students um, that I worked with over the summer. But so this is on Omeka. Um, we have uh, the two exhibits that the students created, Home Field Disadvantage and Playing Outside the Lines. Um, and then we have a directory of um, 
women's sports teams that were compiled through our yearbooks. Oh, and cool. so it was literally us just taking information out of your books and creating a directory. Um, and then the, I guess the third main project, well, there's the timeline too that students conducted um, and created. And then the oral history tab links you out to Aviary, which is an audio visual content management system. Um, so that was, it was kind of a, a fun thing for me to try that platform out. We had all of our interviews professionally transcribed. Um, and so if you uh, could click on one of the links just real quick, Elliot, just to yeah. show very quickly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Listen to the full interview oh. there. Um, if no one has seen Aviary yet, but it's really nice because we can have a full transcript and index. And then um, I did a lot of this processing in Ohms, which is the oral history metadata synchronizer. So it created these um, uh, tabs within the interview that you could just kind of click and fast forward to. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you, Avra. Okay. Oh. Uh, next up, Samantha from San Marcos Public Library. Hello, everybody. And funny enough, we've got like a theme going because I'm only a year removed from San Antonio, um, <laughs> I was San Antonio Public Library and just until last April. And I'm now the public services manager in the San Marcos Public Library. Um, and I'm the person who is in charge of pretty much all of our digital collections. Um, and if you know anything about San Marcos, we're having growing pains. We're growing very rapidly. We've, we're going from being a small city into approaching being a large city. So uh, we are, are taking our efforts to try to do what we can with our within our budget to try to you know expand that collection and um, just working with a lot of it, just every shared resource that we can kind of to try to make as much available as possible to our people, especially during the pandemic. Um, so we, we come from all angles, but um, just like everybody else here, we do have a pretty significant local history collection, and that is probably our most history, interesting collection as well, especially since that is our probably fastest growing collection at this point. Um, started out with donations from local historians, and thanks to our friends of the library group, we were able to digitize basically everything that's in high demand. We do host through Rescarta. Um, you know, the stuff that the, there's a school assignment for every single year that they need to see the documents for, the, just everything that people repeatedly ask for so we can make it available. And the big thing for us is making sure that it's available and searchable so that people don't have to try to navigate through because, you know, it's, it just makes it pretty much inaccessible for people. Um, we are planning on really at this point trying to digitize everything that we have. We did just reopen from a massive expansion. We more than doubled the size of the building, including getting a huge, huge, huge local history room, which is great. So now we can work on trying to get everything online because that's the ultimate goal to kind of get everything online and have it accessible to everybody. I mean, I think the pandemic has shown us that we need to have this stuff available remotely and that is really our goal and uh, we are so lucky to be blessed with amazing volunteers and friends of the library group they actually sit there and do the scanning for us do the cataloging and put everything together otherwise we wouldn't even have nearly as much mm -hmm. as what we have but the goal is we just got a huge donation from uh, author mike cox and we would love to be able to get everything online it's like massive so Hopefully it's going to expand in the near future. <laughs> that's that's incredible. I mean, there's already so much cool stuff in this. So to think about expanding that even more. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Love this picture of Ann Richards. Awesome. Thank you, Samantha. Next up, Prairie View AM. Lisa, I'm not sure if Lisa Stafford was able to make it today. I am here. Oh, hi. Hi. I was just about to uh, give you a, uh, a little instruction. Can you pull up the uh, portal to Texas history? Uh, my colleague's going to talk about this digital commons. That is one of our sites. But if you can, I saw that the portal was talked about in another. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
I'm Lisa Stafford. I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at Prairie View A&M University. And I wanted to show you quickly how we've um, collaborated with the Portal to Texas History. Since we're right here on this screen, um, Elliot, if you can type in Prairie View A&M University and select the, uh, on the any type, select images. And hit search. Um, that's not the thing oh, I got. I think I missed the images. Yes, that's the screen. So if you, um, one of the collaborations with the Portal to Texas History that Prairie View has engaged in is um, there are photographs of some of our historic, historic uh, buildings, historic icons. Um, so this is a, a really nice place to come to get some of uh, some very high quality, high resolution uh, images of some of our historic buildings. Um, LL Foster Hall is a building that's no longer on our campus, but it was um, it was here in the 1900s. And um, so some of that history lives on through the portal. Um, there's another part of the portal that I want to point out. Go back to the first search screen, please. And uh, down, scroll down to the uh, bottom, explore by, the blue tab, explore by partners, partner. And P, select P and Prairie View. Right there. So we've contributed to this site. Scroll down just a bit. We have uh, a publication called the Texas Standard, which was the magazine that was published in uh, like for about four decades. It was the Colored Teachers State Association of Texas magazine. And we contributed uh, our issues to that. And as you can see, there's 98 items. There's two types, one title. Um, we've had over 4,000, um, 47,199 uses of that. Uh, so those are the, uh, those are some of the examples of the ways that we have collaborated externally and my colleague, Mr. Henry Koshi is our scholarly communications librarian. He's going to talk about the digital commons at PVA and you. Hi, good afternoon, this is Henry. Uh, I've been working here for almost seven years. Well, I learned all the digitalization working at TW back in 2012. So I know TW didn't have uh, the digitalization when I worked with these space for TVs and this patient way back in 2012 uh, with the IT director, Dr. David Chuska, who moved to New York. So I got all those uh, training over there and I bought this project over here at the Preview. Uh, then we started this in 2020. So I was trying to go to TDL for getting this space, you know. <laughs> Then uh, we went to BPRESS. So then we signed a contract in 2020. And uh, we got all these, and all these uh, web page was designed by me and my director. We got all the apps. And uh, we are right now full fledged uh, going on, uh, including uh, all these profile page for the professors, all the graduate PhD students, they post their profile there. Thesis in this session right now we have 2000. That's the position we got from the graduate school. All open access journals, OERs, and archives, and businesses and conference. So, yeah, can you click the archive, sir? Yes. So I can click the archive. So, these are all the scans and uploads we did. Uh, anything with uh, uh, a &M, uh, board of directors, uh, annual reports, convocation, uh, commencements, football, 
manual report, everything I put over here. You can click the newspapers uh, down below. Yes. So we have uh, two newspapers, one is the Panther and the Standard. So these are all newspapers we were from 1933 to 2005 with all the metadata. So you can click any of any year. So, so these are all the metadata uh, which you know, people have. I created everything in detail. I have one colleague. We are almost short of staff. <laughs> so we have only two people and my students, of course, can scan all these documents without the right one do anything. So yeah, we added all these and we were really uploading all the stuff. So when we had the pandemic, we had to put from home, getting all these things uploaded to the So yeah, you can go back, I go to the new, uh, yeah, you can go to the yearbooks. Huh? Down below on the publication, yes. So these are all the yearbooks. Uh, I preview way back from 19, uh, you can go down 1919, I think. Uh, 17. 17, yeah. Yeah. So I think we lost some, uh, new, I think, uh, yearbooks, I think, because of the fire or something long back in the 60s and 70s. That's what I'm thinking of from the afterwards. So these are all the collection. We have for the yearbooks. So it's a beautiful uh, uh, collections. Uh, we have more collections that will be coming in. Uh, right now, I'm working on an exhibit. I uh, have some more old buildings. Uh, you, can, you can go back soon. Yeah, you can go down the law. Oh, this is an old screen. Okay, it didn't come here. You have to refresh this thing. So we, yeah, if you can refresh the screen. Yeah, you can click the preservation weak point. So this was the image uh, collection, which uh, uh, Digital Common B Press just started it last year. That's in December. So this is an exhibit. Uh, this is just on the Digital Common. So we have an exhibit web page which I have to create and all these will be migrated to the exhibit. So right now this is just a page I have with all the metadata and stuff. I didn't add the intro text and other stuff, each and everything detail about the whole thing. I have to create a web page on the exhibit. Uh, then we'll be moving all these things, all the images in there and then we'll be adding a complete full a full fledged <laughs> exhibit. So we are still on process with all these things while well, it take time. So yeah, I just want to show you something. So you Thank guys you. can you know play with it, check with this, all the history. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing. And it's it's really great to see both the sort of stuff that's in the portal of sexist history and the stuff that's in your own uh, IR. It's it's just really, really fascinating collection. So thank you for sharing them. Thank you. And next is the Dallas Way. Robert, were you able to make it today? Or if you wanted to say anything about these collections. Well, I can say um, Robert Emery shared these with us. And um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Dallas Way. It's an organization in Dallas that's dedicated to preserving LGBTQ history um, in North Texas. Um, and they have this really phenomenal collaboration with UNT Library Special Collections. Um, so there's these incredibly rich collections in the portal of Texas history. Um, I was playing around with it earlier today and there's just a really, a ton of fascinating looking collections. Um, I could kind of spend hours and hours and hours looking at these stuff, the stuff. Um, there's just, it's it's a lot of like really kind of the day-to-day -day work of community organizations and political activists that I, I just found really fascinating. And I just think it's such a cool, cool collaboration between the Dallas Way and UNT. Um, so, so I was excited to, to dig into that a little bit. So any, questions or comments uh, for this most recent group of folks, feel free to unmute or drop it in the chat.
I love the kind of I, I didn't plan this when I was grouping folks together, but the sort of connections between the, the different types of things people are doing. All right. Well, let's keep going then. Next up. Nicole from Texas State. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nicole Critchley, um, she, her. Um, and I wanted to share off our um, San Marcos Daily Record Negative Collection. I really enjoyed these paper more collections. Um, I've worked with several of them, and they really do document, you know, real life and buildings in the community. Um, so there is a caveat I would do want to say is that um, we've digitized up until 1961. And while this is a long running paper, it really only documents one segment of San Marcos community and society and coverage is very thin on our Latino and black communities here in San Marcos. Um, and so this is just one of our many negative collections. Uh, we got this collection in 2016. Um, and the next year we received a grant to start digitizing these and we've digitized just under 10,000 images. Um, and so at Texas State, we don't really have a platform that can handle um, access really well or image access really well, especially one, one that we can just dump thousands of negatives in without much data. Um, Flickr uh, seemed to be the place that we could do this and that we could provide access um, that we needed to do for this grant. Um, and we also wanted to kind of engage the local community and help us ID these images. And so um, we've gotten two volunteers that have really helped us cite things using the public library's resources, especially their digitized microfilm of the newspaper. So shout out. Um, and we've also had student workers work on this, especially during COVID. Um, and so they were able, the student workers were able to help us apply tags to our internal database. And so then we were able to push them to Flickr to help those searching uh, the collections. Um, and there are always surprises with these, um, like, these negatives aren't super well organized. So we have things like the San Antonio missions just popping up in an envelope titled British Boys. Um, there's <laughs> a pictures of Girl Scouts um, biking by our five mile dam park here in town. Um, that's like, was just in between car accident photos. And so digitization is really how we like access things here. Um, and so we have everything from, you know, photos of Shark Campus, um, photos of Aquamana Springs, um, before the university bought it in the 1990s. We have community images, and also we have lots of images from the family that used to own and run the newspaper. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give this a shout out, and especially if you can help us ID images, feel free to leave a comment. We always appreciate it. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. These photos are so, so cool. And I, I love that, again, this kind of cross-pollination between collections. Yeah. Next up, David from UT Austin. Hey everybody, I'm David Bliss. I'm the Systems and Digital Archivist at UT Austin um, at the libraries. Um, I also uh, contribute to the Human Rights Documentation Initiative, which is a libraries project um, that you see here. So um, the HRDI is a um, project that collects uh, archival collections from partners all over the world. Um, they're mostly AV collections um, and they're all related in some way to human rights struggles. Um, it's an old project uh, launched in, I think 2008. Um, and last year was our first web platform migration since that year or around that year. So a long overdue uh, migration. Um, the site that you see here is built with the uh, Django CMS um, and the collection access portal uh, is built using Blacklight. Before this, the old version of the site, which launched, or before this version of the site, um, which launched in December, we had separate websites for information about the HRDI project and access to the collection. So it was kind of confusing for users. Um, it was frankly confusing for us as uh, managers of the collections. Um, the, the new site uses these two different platforms, but it integrates them in, uh, as seamless as possible uh, of a way. So users can't really tell that they're jumping from Django to Blacklight and back um, when browsing. Um, the old site was, uh, the access site especially was pretty buggy, search didn't really work. 
Um, and it was built on a platform that wasn't really uh, made for archival collections. So we were mm. sort of uh, butting up against it a lot when we wanted to create, uh, uh, you know, landing pages for a collection or subseries or something like that. Uh, it was kind of a pain. Um, and it was also built with uh, Adobe Flash. That's how we provided streaming access to the AV collections. Adobe Flash is no longer supported. So we, we urgently needed something. And that was the, the impetus for this project. Um, and as you can see with the new site, we're able to provide all kinds of contextual info about these collections. Um, we have a lot more control over the static text. We can edit it ourselves and um, add collections and items. Um, and if you'll click uh, Elliot on, on that Voces de Mujeres collection, you'll go to the Blacklight site and you'll see um, sort of pre-populated search results for that collection. That's how we're handling this. And we've got a uh, search and facet uh, functionality at the top and left. Um, so you can see the metadata uh, and, and it's drawing on that. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just clicking on that video there, that number five, uh, this is, it's streaming now with HTML5 player, everything you'd expect from a modern site. Um, we also have uh, captions for all videos and transcripts for all audio objects, which is great, makes our collections much more accessible. Um, so I mentioned the old site used Flash. Uh, every time we wanted to add an object to any of our collections on the old site, we had to manually create a new page and manually ingest the object and enter Dublin Core metadata. It was really not built for work at scale. Um, with the new site, uh, it's much better. We, we uh, just manage the collections through our UTL dams like we would any other collection at the libraries. Um, and we publish them to the front end, um, which is what you see here. So um, one of the things I like most about it is that it's very easy to do lots of collection items uh, or work with lots of collection items at once and add lots of things at once. Um, so as a result of sort of having access to these tools, um, we're actually in the early stages of potentially acquiring a collection from an HRDI partner, a new partner for the first time in I think six years at least. Um, so the HRDI was kind of dormant um, because we, we couldn't really work at the scale needed to provide access to the collections that someone might be interested in, in donating. So this is uh, setting us up to potentially reactivate the project. Um, and if, if I'm okay on time, if you wouldn't mind clicking on that web archive button at the, on the banner. Yeah. The other part of the site that I wanted to show off, this is our um, access portal to our web archive. So we have uh, an archive uh, of web resources archived through the uh, Internet Archives Archive It service. And they have an API that we were able to draw on um, to list all of our um, archived websites and provide access to them through the Wayback Machine. So this used to be a actually a third website that we had to point people to if they wanted to access our, our web content. So um, it is all together in one place that people can hopefully browse and access. Um, I'll just uh, say that if you are interested in poking around in these collections, I invite you to do so. You should know that some of it is pretty graphic. Um, so uh, we tried to put warnings wherever possible. Um, but uh, it's uh, something you should know before you get into it. So thank you. Thank you, David. It, it is really cool to see everything kind of brought together in one, in one site. So congratulations on the new site. Next up, Fort Worth Public Library. Jennifer, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about these collections. If Jennifer is here. No, it would help if I unmuted, sorry. <laughs> I actually started my video instead of unmuting. Hi, I'm Jennifer Broncato, archivist at the Fort Worth Public Library. Um, this is a site we've had for quite a while now. We are constantly adding to it. Um, one thing that I would like to show, if you go down um, to the next page, actually, um, what I have done a little bit further, I've started adding the Jubilee Theater exhibit, adding our Omeka um, exhibits onto there. So it then links out to um, just our Omeka site. 
So it's kind of all in one location. Um, this was a, a community theater, one of the longest running African American theaters in Fort, uh, in Texas, actually. Um, we got their papers quite a while back and we recently got a grant to have them processed as part of that uh, grant we were going to do a in-person presentation about the theater as well as a in-person exhibit that all happened during covid so we scrambled to come up with a way to do it so we purchased omeka which we now use for other things as well uh, but to create this online exhibit for them. We had no plans to digitize the entire collection right now because it was not processed, but you can see there's galleries of some of their more popular shows. Um, we put a listing of all of their seasons um, on the side so you can go and look at all the decades to see what shows they have performed. Uh, some of these shows were written by the founder, Rudy Eastman. So we, we have some of his scripts that we hope one day uh, to digitize. And then of course we did do our, our presentation, which we have embedded in the website as well. So you can watch the full presentation. So that's how we we kind of shifted during COVID to make the grant process uh, work for us because all of this was was supposed to be done, yeah, live. <laughs> so awesome! Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I I love this, and I I love embedding the exhibits within the the digital collections page, so they're all you know, all in one place, which is how people would look for them. And this site looks great. I want to go explore it a bunch more myself. So thank you. Thank you. And next is uh, the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And David Bigwood shared this. I'm not sure he was going to be able to make it. Oh, is here but doesn't have a mic or a camera. So I'll just share a little bit about this collection. Um, so this is the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package collection. Um, and one of the things David told me about this collection is that it was used to solve a science mystery, to solve a 40-year-old mystery on deviation in temperature from expected values returned by experiments left on the moon, which is like the coolest sentence I have possibly said in the last like three years of my life. Um, and because of that, LPI the, this and this collection is linked to in the acknowledgments of a scientific paper in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets, um, which I just think is just a great example of how these materials can be used in all sorts of ways. Um, and David also mentioned to me that most of the items in the collection are unique and that the collection is harvested by aggregators like OCLC and CORE and BASE so that the material can be found by researchers, um, which is just a great example of how, you know, the more ways we can make collections available, the more people can use them and solve them to solve, use them to solve science mysteries, which I just think is so cool. So thank you, David, for, for sharing this with us. And next, I wanted to share, now it's my turn to share my own thing. Um, I wanted to share a project from the Digital Public Library of America. It's called the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection. And it's a site they launched, I think about a year ago. I meant to look up exactly when it launched, but um, it's a project that they did that brings together a lot of materials from institutions that are shared with the DPLA and provides sort of context around Black women's role in the suffrage movement, civil rights movement, kind of more broadly, women's activism, civil rights activism. Um, and so they have a lot of great interpretive context. They have this awesome timeline. They have some kind of biographies of individuals where you can sort of learn more about them. And then what I think is so cool is you can go from these biographies and then it takes you, you can search it within the collection for materials that are shared with the DPLA. Um, about these individuals or about these topics. And so you'll see there's materials from Duke, from Boston Public Library, all sorts of different libraries who have shared these materials with DPLA. And DPLA has sort of 
selected the ones that are relevant for this topical portal. And so they're discoverable here, which I think is just a really cool example of how how you can bring to bring together materials and help people find things that they might not otherwise know about. Um, so, so yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, and Elliot, that's growing, right? It is. Yeah. It's so it's, it's constantly growing. Um, it's constantly, every time new materials are added to DPLA, if they're relevant to this project, they'll also appear in the black women suffrage uh, portal. And there's, there's materials from, UNT. Um, so all the things, as I said, that are in the portal, if they're relevant, they'll be here. Things that are shared up through TDL's uh, DPLA aggregation service as well appear in this site. I also saw that Robert was able to join us. And I wonder if Robert wants to say a little something about um, those exhibits. Are you still here, Robert Emery? Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh, God. I'm so glad you made it. Fantastic. I, I've been here the whole time. I just, I had no idea I was part of the program. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so you want me to say something about our fabulous collection at UNT? I mean, yeah. If you would like to, we would love you to. Well, one thing I would like everyone to know is that I'm honored to be with you because I'm not a librarian, that all of the members of the Dallas Way are community volunteers. And we have a lot of knowledge that we'd like to share with you if you as an institution are having any challenges reaching the community because we consider ourselves experts on on how to be community volunteers and work with the university. We have had the most marvelous relationship with the librarians at UNT, and we'd love to see that happen more and more often. And so any way we can help with that, we want to help with that. That's wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments before we move on to the final, final hey, Elliot, group of folks? Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Um, I just have a question about the DPLA exhibits. Um, who creates those, or how do they? How do they choose what they're going to? I mean, this women's suffrage, Black women's suffrage, is amazing, um, and I'm curious if it's staff or. This one was was staff at DPLA. Okay. Who led this project? Yeah. Um. There's there's actually a similar portal, um, that is about. It's kind of the the structure is the same, but it's about um, aviation history, um, and that is that one came about as part of a, a sort of multi institution grant, um, including my previous institution when I was at the University of Miami. Fun. Um. So there's there've been a couple of different iterations of that, but but the Black women's suffrage did come from DPLA. Great, it's amazing. And thanks for highlighting it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments at this point? All right, the next up is William from UT Rio Grande Valley. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's, it's me, William Flores. Um, I'm the Institutional Repository Specialist um, under Scholarly Communications here at UTRGV. And uh, this is one collection that we are wanting to highlight. Um, it's called Stories from Texas. Um, these are short vig vignettes um, that explain life throughout the entire Lone Star State and are written by William F. Strong. Um, they are originally broadcasted on the Texas Standard, a news network of uh, NPR stations in Texas. Um, Dr. Strong is a UTRGV communications professor and is a well-known Texas raconteur. Um, so how we obtained the collection. So uh, mid-November of 2021, um, 
one of these podcasts actually appeared on my news feed um, and I thought to reach out to Dr. Strong. Um, so I emailed him um, informing him that we would that the library would like to upload the collection um, into our institutional repository uh, for long-term preservation and access, um, as well as indexing in Google and Google Scholar. And um, he was thrilled, I mean, he was honored. And as a copyright holder, um, he gave us permission to do this. Um, we processed the collection by adding metadata scrubbed from, scrubbed, um, from sites that already had transcript of podcast. Um, we cleaned up um, the metadata and transcribed most of the submissions that didn't have um, any, transcri any transcription and added other metadata. Um, so once we finished processing the collection um, in mid-January no mid of this year, 2022, um, we set out uh, as a department to look out for classes that might benefit from the collection. So um, as we were going through our course catalogs, uh, we found one, the Texas History 3300 um, as a class that might be related, uh, that might teach uh, might teach um, on, on the topics related to the, to what this collection has. So um, we emailed a couple of the faculty members um, with the brief with the brief overview of the collection, uh, encouraging them to utilize it as a possible assignment for students. Um, like I said, this is still a, a fresh collection in our repository, so uh, I'm sure it's going to take a <laughs> a bit of time. And um, obviously, this collection will probably keep growing, so we'll be looking uh, monthly to see of any new podcast that Dr. Shr that Dr. Strong might uh, might be producing. Um, just a brief um, brief uh, bit of the of the collection. So, stories from Texas first hit the airwaves about eleven years ago on in the Rio Grande Valley Public Radio, um, eighty eight FM, and then in twenty fifteen, Dr. Strong jumped to the online podcast format. Uh, and then fast forward to 2022, um, he has produced over 100 podcasts and, and he has written two volumes of a book titled um, Stories from Texas, Some of Them Are True. <laughs> so um, Dr. Strong, in one of, the, uh, one of an interview that he had with the university, he stated that he loves radio because there is a certain magic that is achieved by a single voice creating a whole world within your mind. It has always been a medium for storyteller at least, that is more mesmerizing than television. Um, it is a theater of the mind. And that was a direct quote from him. And uh, the seed for Stories from Texas was planted decades ago when Strong was growing up in Falfurias, Texas, in a book-filled home with his mother, a librarian, and a father, an educator passionate about Texas history, uh, of Texas taught, uh, taught tales. So, Elliot, uh, I'm going to be giving you some URLs. Um, so if you can add 41 to the URL, it should take you to the, yeah, Texas used to be bigger. So in this one, uh, the northern boundary of Texas in those days stretched all the way up to what is today's southern Wyoming. Um, it's true. In those days, the northernmost town in Texas was not, was not Dalhart. It was Rollins. You think that's a long way from Brownsville to Dalhart now at 860, try 1,400 <laughs> miles to Rawlings. So uh, in those years, uh, the trip would be measured in seasons, not days. Uh, another, um, if you can change it to 20 now, instead of 41. This one talks about Oscar Wilde visiting Texas. Uh, during an 1882 lecture a tour of Texas, he stated that Evidently, men in Texas cannot survive more than an hour between beers. <laughs> um, uh, finally, another one is another, uh, this one's 87. Um, another one that resonates with us is on Waterburger. I tell you, if the Pentagon, <laughs> if the, hey, what about the women in Texas, right? <laughs> I tell you, if the Pentagon will make MRE Waterburgers, it would lift morale. <laughs> So um, some people who live in Whataburger less states will drive a couple of days to get a Whataburger. Um, so <laughs> Dr. Strong believes such stories help form the foundation of Texans' persistent self-image as fiercely independent folk that have been reinforced by countless Hollywood movies and other pop culture symbols such as Lonesome Dove. 
Um, and finally, <laughs> other topics include agriculture, the weather, presidents from Texas, uh, medicine, geography, social media, folklore, music, language, authors, and sports, um, to name a few. So thank you. Yes, that's stories from Texas. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> also, as someone who used to live in a state without a Whataburger, can confirm, would drive a long time. <laughs> right? <laughs> For some spicy ketchup. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, William. You're welcome. All right. Up next, Dallas Morning News. Spencer. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope y'all can hear me. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Spencer Beavis, and I'm the digital archivist for the Dallas Morning News. Um, our archive is available at um, archives.dallasnews.com. Um, our premier... Our premier product is the entire publication history for the Dallas Morning News um, from when we started in 1885 to the present day. Um, it's entirely viewable and searchable online for our um, paid subscribers. Um, up at the top, we also have the special collections page, which is where we highlight our coverage of topics and persons of interest in order to create a, a full picture of what made that event important and how it impacted our city and our communities. So you can see that we have stuff on the Cowboys, stuff on Neiman Marcus, stuff on um, coverage of African American life in Dallas. And we're always trying to add and um, include more um, coverage in our special collection based on what interests people, what people really want to learn about our city. Um, and we we really value these special collections pages. Um, for example, the, the special collections page on the, um, on the assassination of President Kennedy in, in 1963. Um, it doesn't just include the front page the day after the assassination, but it also features materials on um, the aftermath, Jack Ruby, the Warren Commission, um, conspiracy theories. And so we really, we really aim to just give the full picture of what, of what our coverage of, of the historical events was like. Um, and I think these these special collections really illustrate and really help us achieve that goal in micro -cons. We have the whole publication history, but then we also have these um, special collections that I think really interesting and really worth diving into for our for our readers and for our subscribers. Um, we're always looking to add to and uh, and improve our special collections. And uh, later in 2022, we're we're happy to roll out the whole publication history of the. Um, of the Pulitzer Prize winning Dallas Times Herald, which was the other um, large daily newspaper in, in Dallas as well. Um, and that'll also be available to subscribers. Um, that's about it for me. It was pretty, pretty quick, but if you guys have any questions or comments or suggestions, um, feel free to reach out. Um, I can drop my email in the chat box if that's all right with people. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out if you guys have any questions or comments or anything, thanks. Thank you, Spencer. And this homepage with the scrolling covers is like mesmerizing. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, next up, Catherine from UT Austin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not highlighting a specific collection. Well, the PCL map collection, the online collection, was a huge collection that was based on HTML. And this is its new landing page. And I'm really excited about this because we get to highlight that even though it's called the PCL map collection and people relate that to one space, it really represents map collections across UT campus and also national and international collaborations. And now we're moving those collections into our collections portal and to, into a geodata portal. So our collections portal, many of you will be um, familiar with. It's a, a place where we can share, yes, thank you, um, larger, you know, larger size images than we can on an HTML page, and also much more metadata with better context for the mapping. Um, you know, just better, because out, out in the world with those JPEGs from the HTML page, just in HTML, most of the metadata was in the heading of the HTML, to give you an idea. Could you go back for me, Elliot? Of course. Um, one thing I can highlight in our collections portal that I'm pretty excited about, if you scroll up and um, hit owning repository, 
And then the PCL libraries maps. Oh, shoot. If you just search Fenton for me in the regular, thank you. F -E yes, perfect. So this, this represents a collection that be belonged to one man that was in both World War I and World War II and their, um, his field maps. This is the, was the first collection we put into the collections portal. And it's also the first collection in our collections portal that was not on the PCL map website. So it's it's novel. Um, the, the the website has gotten a lot of hits throughout the years since 1994, but this is novel to this. And we've all, I've, we've also created a an exhibit in our um, spotlight exhibits for this, so we can tell the story his story a little bit more. And we're poised. And I'm going to say because it's not my job, and we're having. Um, a little scripting issue, but they're also going to be in the geodata portal very soon. So the G in the geodata portal, we're able to geo reference and share geo share geo reference maps. So people that want to take those into GIS software or integrate them into ArcMap, um, those will be in there. And if you hit scan maps there, those are the maps that are already in there. Um, during COVID, because of lockdown restrictions, um, and also very, I have to shout out, I think Mirko was on this at one point, and David Bliss, through a lot of help, not just my own, you know, before lockdown, I was facing trying to create metadata for 70,000 objects from the website, you know, and thinking about that, and, you know, the the added value with the collections portal is that added metadata, but um, with some help from my colleagues and also people that weren't able, people that generally had jobs that in physical space also helped us kind of collect and clean up a lot of metadata. And so now presently we have 14,000 and we're po poised to get another 8,000 army SAP map service maps in there um, pretty soon. Again. Um, I'm not going to put any pressure on my colleagues to give you a timeline, but it's coming and it's exciting. Thank you. <laughs> that is exciting. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. Really neat. Next is an exhibit from Texas State that Aaron shared. Aaron, are you here? Would you like to share a little bit about this exhibit or anyone else from Texas State? I don't know if I can, this is Lauren. I'm in the Whitliff collections and this is a, um, whew, let's see how I do. This is a neat, <laughs> this is an interesting item. It's, um, there's lots of different ways to talk about, you know, uh, colonialism. This is one of the first books that was, I think it's claimed to claim is that it was printed in Texas. So it's a copy of this La Relacion, which is also a really cool series because that's everybody reporting back to Spain on what they found. Um, and I don't think it's very reliable, but I actually have not looked through this, so I don't really know. But um, our Aaron's group, um, I don't know. Yeah, if you just go read the Relacion online, it's nice because you can, they made these just really nice, high quality scans so you can like super scan in if you wanted to and then um the exhibit's nice because you can page by page see the translation of what's happening so um yeah there you go we all know we could have all translated that first one um, <laughs> and then the other sort of added value if you want to go back to that landing page is that um Y'all might remember his name, which is going to come to me. Um, let's see, how about the one on the left? Is that the one I want? Yeah, try that one. His name is, oh, I wanted to point you to the Frank de la Teja. Um, there's, he, he recorded like, I don't know, six or eight videos specifically talking about different aspects of blah, blah, blah. So it's pretty low. It's pretty like, I think these are like five or six minutes and real, um, 
not scholarly. I mean, he's a scholar, but it's meant for um, more like public public history stuff. And I actually don't know what else is on the website. Those are the two things that I know about that are cool. Um, but y'all are gonna have to poke around and find some more. That is great. Thank you, Lauren. And again, thank you. Didn't mean to to put you on the spot to talk about something that's not I, I did okay. so <laughs> your you. thing. But yeah, no, it's great. Thanks for that. I also just think it's a stunning exhibit. So um, I enjoyed kind of poking around it a little bit. It myself. is really pretty. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then our last last site for the day um, was shared another from UT Austin shared by Adriana Casares who couldn't make it today, um, but asked me to just say a little bit about this exhibit, which is called Elsewhere and Otherwise, Imagination and World Making in the Black Queer Studies Collection. Um, and Adriana told, asked me to say that this interac interactive online exhibit was curated by Nathan Alexander Moore, a doctoral candidate in African and African Diaspora Studies. It features books and films from the UT Library's groundbreaking Black Queer Studies Collection. Um, and I, again, just like a lot of the other things we've seen today, I love that it sort of provides context about the materials and, and gives you an entry point into really this um, unique and I think really important collection at UT Libraries. So I enjoyed kind of poking around in there a little bit as well. And so that's that's it. That's all of the, the collections and sites that we had um, lined up to share today. So. We've got some time for questions, comments, thoughts, things that you sort of were sparked that you want to share with other folks at this point. I haven't seen a lot of questions um, coming in through the chat, but again, I want to remind everybody to unmute and ask. Um, this is Lucy Goosey, and we're happy to hear your voice. Um, but I do, uh, I wanted to say something, and I wrote myself a note for, for Nicole um, about crowdsourcing since Nicole shared the Flickr crowdsourcing and of identification. In, in one of my first student jobs at an archives in Portland, Oregon, we, we had physical, you know, it was pre-Flickr, or at least very like few people used Flickr back then, and certainly not archives um, of that size. <laughs> And so we would take the physical photographs from the early days of the firemen in Portland, and we would go to the firemen breakfast with all the like 80 to 90 year old firemen, and they loved it. We'd go through things. They'd be they'd talk about like, oh, that's when we got the keg and everything went crazy. Um, <laughs> so it's really it's cool for me to see that that's progressed and that folks are using crowdsourcing, but in different ways now. And also just gosh, everybody who shared today, this was fantastic, fantastic. I really just wish that I could spend the entire next month of my life just looking at all of these things and all of these really cool collections. Thank you for the community notes too with all the links because I am gonna go back and visit a lot of these. It's nice to have them all in there. I guess that was my question. So the community links has all of the archives that uh, shared links today, right? Great. So it should. Coffee and on a cold if I night. missed any, please feel free to to add it in there. Cup of coffee, cup of hot cocoa on a cold night. There you go. <laughs> Sitting there, scrolling the archives. Oh my gosh, you're painting the best picture. <laughs> <laughs> my Saturday night. That sounds like a dream Saturday night to me. Mm -hmm. It's going to be cool out. Well, in here, and for me, I'm from South Texas. So, <laughs> what do y'all think about doing this again? Kind of another opportunity for show and tell later in the year. Yes, please. No hesitation. Yes, please. <laughs> Right? We never get to do this. We never get to just look at everybody else's stuff. Yeah. And we get so busy with our project. It's really great to see what other people are doing. And I tend to, like, 
I focus on, oh, what repository system is it in? What metadata standard do they use that I, I don't even look at the stuff, but it's the stuff that's exciting. As much as I love metadata, I love the stuff more. I don't know when we're going to do this again, but by the time probably that we do it again, um, we've just been awarded a Getty Images grant. <laughs> so we'll be collaborating with Getty and we'll have images uh, from Prairie View in, in the Getty. That's phenomenal. Congratulations on that grant. It looks so exciting. Thank you. I think, I think uh, we had gotten an NEH grant first and then I guess that sort of helped, you know, propel us to the Getty. So, um, you know, it's very good, very good for the institution. Well, any, any last thoughts or, or things, other sites that folks want to share in our last couple minutes? And if not, we're going to do it again. Leah, do you want to share those closing slides? While she's sharing her screen, I just want to echo what everybody's saying in the chat, which is great job to Elliot. Thank you, Elliot, for getting us all together to have this conversation because we don't do it often enough. And if uh, anybody out there hasn't gotten to know Elliot before now, it's, I'm, I'm so excited that you have today. We're so excited to have him on board with TDL. It was really fun today. Yeah, this, this has been phenomenal. Just thank you all again um, for participating today, for making it so much fun and so so interesting. Um, again, as, as this is my first event that I've hosted for TDL, just what a wonderful, what a wonderful way for me to get to know all of you and, and get to know everyone's uh, collections. So again, we are gonna be sharing out the captioned recording of today's webinar as soon as we can. So be on the lookout for that and feel free to share it with colleagues who you think might be interested. Um, we are planning on doing more of these. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Maybe keep it in the back of your mind as you have new collections and new projects coming down the pipeline, things that you might wanna share with us. Um, and as a final reminder, we'd love to have you join us at TDL. Um, please email us at info at tdl.org if you wanna learn more about any of our services, including Text Hub and DPLA aggregation. I'd love to talk to you about it. And I think with that, I'll close out. Uh, hope everyone stays happy and healthy. Take care and see you again soon.